think the main problem with the EU is even though it's all set up completely democratically is that people feel that it's something that is done to them um, rather than something that they are active agents in. What is the value of citizens participation in European politics? Well, we've spoken to a number of experts and people who work within the European Union to explore this question further. Elisa Leroni works for ECAS, the European Citizens Action Service, which is a Brussels-based non-profit organisation that has worked on increasing citizens' democratic participation in the EU. We started by asking her, what is the value of participatory democracy more generally? There has been research showing how there is a potential of these digital tools to, uh, for example, also engage uh, um, citizens that usually do not engage in policy making processes, such as young people, um, but also how um, uh, actually the legitimacy of the, the policy making itself increases because citizens uh, um, get to know about the policy. They enter into a sort of learning curve about what policy making is, and then they actually have some sort of impact in the output of the policy making. So this means that um, um, in the end, um, you know, the, the final policy is uh, is just more legitimate in that sense. Professor David Farrell from the UCD School of Politics and International Relations is a specialist within the study of representation, elections parties and deliberative mini-publics. We similarly asked him why, in the first instance, should we even bother engaging ordinary citizens within politics? Why not follow a more technocratic model of governance, where political decisions are made primarily by technical experts, such as the European Commission, for example? You know, there's all this discussion about democratic crisis. Um, and I think, you know, it's a very pessimistic and a very sorry uh, sort of tale that's been told, and it's very dystopian and you know, we're all going to, you know, all going to hell. And I think it forgets that democracies evolve all the time. They, democracies are forever changing. There's ways in which our democracy has been run today that are very different from what we saw five, 10, 20 years ago. And that's the same in pretty much all countries. Um, and what's interesting is that, and many people have written up on this, and I, my, my colleague and I had a paper only recently published in which we're making this argument. Um, a lot of the changes that we're seeing uh, speak to a kind of democracy that is less fixated about on votes and a demo instead a democracy that's thinking more about citizens voice so it's a it's a it's a different conception of democracy the, the traditional vote centered conception is a, is one which sees the citizen as very passive the job of the citizen is every 5 years to kick the rascals out and that's it and then you retreat back to your daily lives and wait for the next time there's a general election in a voice-centered democracy, you've got everything from protesting, petitioning, um, you know, uh, rioting, gluing your hands to the gates, all of that sort of stuff. But you also have citizens' assemblies. You've got freedom of information so you can become more informed. You've got, um, so you've got the whole open government thing. But particularly, it's this thing of engagement in policy processes in between elections. And that this speaks to uh, a citizenry who are actually calling for this. So while there are some who might argue the citizens are tired and jaded and not interested in politics, the reality is when you survey citizens and you ask them in a way in which they can understand the question, whether they might like to be involved in citizens' assemblies, or indeed if you ask them after they've heard it, actually been involved, they like it and they want it and they want more of it. So what is the EU doing in response to this calling? The most prominent and recent example is the Conference on the Future of Europe. The conference is a citizen-centred project to shape and guide political change across the Union. Throughout the 27 member states, citizens took part in locally organised events and forums and came up with concrete policy recommendations for the future. Daniel Ferry is a spokesperson for the European Commission and has worked on the conference, among other things. The European Commission is responsible for drawing up proposals for new European legislation and it implements decisions made by the European Parliament and the Council of the EU. We've had and still have an online platform where people contribute their thoughts and we've had a number of meetings where you have randomly selected citizens describing and deliberating what they want. And now we are going to the very end where you have the plenary sessions where you discuss these issues and whittle them down basically to a report with a collection of recommendations. Deliberative democracy and representative democracy go together 
and we're not trying to change anything in the way in which democracies work across the European Union, but we think it is really important to hear from its people, and that's what the Conference on the Future of Europe is all about. It's about listening to people from right across the EU, from all four corners, hear what they have to say, and ultimately come together with a big set of recommendations from them, which they will deliver to us. Here in the European Commission, both the European Parliament and the Council, which is over there, and then we'll take it forward. While the conference has managed to involve almost 600,000 citizens throughout its various events across the EU, it has received some criticism. This is not to say there haven't been shortcomings in the citizen assemblies. For one, the panels failed to be as inclusive as they should have been, lacking representation from marginalised groups across Europe from residents without EU passports to racial and ethnic communities. And there may be a pro-EU bias on the part of those saying yes to a phone call requesting their participation in an EU-led exercise. The methodology for random selection can therefore be improved to take not only socio-economic but also ideological factors into account. It risks exacerbating existing inequalities rather than reducing them. The Conference on the Future of Europe has been the biggest exercise in participatory democracy in the history of the EU. It opens up the question, what's next? What will be the impact of the conference and its recommendations? And by extension, the potential of citizens' participation in future European politics. I think that um, at the moment, the main question, as you mentioned, is really how are these uh, citizen recommendations actually going to have an impact on policy making? Uh, at the end of the day. And unfortunately, from what we've seen, um, this wasn't clear since the beginning of the process, and it means that it is still unclear in the middle of the process, and most probably it will be unclear in the end of the process. Um, I've heard from Vice President Jurava, for example, that she is very much keen on making sure that there is some sort of impact of these citizens' recommendations into policy making, at least from the side of the European Commission. Um, Some MEPs have have also advocated for the same things. The Council is always a bit of a question mark, uh, um, so we hope that uh, that institution will also back up these recommendations. And unfortunately, we just don't have real guidelines of in which way these uh, uh, will actually impact policy making. I mean, her main message is that, you know, they're It's good that this is happening and it's a positive thing, but the fact that it is happening is not enough. Something has to, you know, there is often, you know, or sometimes at the EU level, there's a big announcement, you we're doing this for um, citizens and it's going to be really great. And then it's difficult to find something that emerges concretely from that. So, um, and her big point was, you know, it mustn't be a, a citizen washing exercise um, where you've said, OK, this is, looks good, um, but actually nothing emerges from it. The European Commission, along with the Council and the European Parliament, are responsible for taking forward the recommendations made by the conference. How might citizens' involvement in European politics take shape following the conference? And what does this exercise in participatory democracy have in store for citizens in the future? What does the conference have in store afterwards? Once we get to the 9th of May and the recommendations will be delivered, we will have to see. Because for once, with the conference, it is really in the hands of the citizens who are taking part. It is not for us to say, yes, we need to do A, B or C. It is for the citizens to decide, so we'll see. I wouldn't be surprised if it continues in some form or another. I mean, the way in which it works right now will come to an end on the 9th, but there could be a new phase. Whether that is the continuation, in one way or another, of the website, the platform, for example, could be an option, but it remains to be seen, really. The potential for greater citizens' participation in European politics could range from a continuation of the conference's online platform to a more permanent structure, as mentioned by the previous speakers. What form this will take may shape the future of Europe. If you have enjoyed this episode brought to you by the Brussels Insider, Tune in to the next one, where we will be exploring the issue of lobbying within the European Union. Mm-hmm.